Hear these words from the book that we love. In the day when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man from Bethlehem of Judah went into the country of Moab. He, along with his wife and their two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and his wife, Naomi, and their two sons, Malhan and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem of Judah. They entered the land of Moab and lived there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died leaving her with her two sons. They took Moabite wives. One was named Orpah. The other was named Ruth. They remained in the country of Moab for ten years. And then, Malhan and Chilion died. And so the woman was left without her husband and without her two sons. And so she started back to Judah, where she was from, because she heard in Moab that the Lord had remembered his people and had given them food. So she started out back towards Judah with her daughters-in-law. They headed in that direction. But Naomi said to her daughter-in-laws, Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you would find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. And she wept aloud and kissed them. But they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said to them, No, go back. Go back. Why will you follow me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they would be your husbands? No, turn back, my daughters, for I am far too old to have a husband. And even if I thought that there was hope for me, and even if I thought that tonight I might find a husband and bear sons, would you wait until they have grown? Would you refrain from marrying? No. No, it has been far more bitter for me than it has been for you, for the hand of the Lord has turned against me. And she wept even louder. But Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Naomi and Ruth held on to one another. So Naomi said to Ruth, See, your sister-in-law has left back to her people and to her gods. Go and return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said to Naomi, Do not press me, and do not force me to leave you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may it be so that the Lord would do even more, even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw how determined Ruth was, she said no more to her. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Those were the first 18 verses of the book of Ruth. If you would be so kind, I would like those of you to raise your hand nice and high for everyone to see if you currently have or because she has gone on to glory had a loving mother-in-law. All right, let's set them down. Now please raise your hand if you think currently you are a loving mother-in-law. <laughs> what a honest congregation <laughs> that I serve. Thank you. I too have a loving mother-in-law, Patty Jo Decavers. She's my wife's best friend and a fun grandma for our boys. She's silly and makes soupy mashed potatoes. She loves seven and sevens, and if you don't know what one of those is, come and find me after the service, or better yet, come to the manse after the gathering, and we will share one. She says the word to gather, and we tease her for that. She loves Jesus, and she loves the church. And I can say with concrete confidence that I am without a doubt her favorite son-in-law. <laughs> I am her only son-in-law, but I am her favorite. This morning we are going to consider this powerful story in the book of Ruth, exploring loving mother-in-laws. We'll look at that phrase, the title of this morning's sermon, from two angles. The first, from the angle and perspective of Naomi, who was indeed a loving mother-in-law. We'll then look at this phrase from the perspective of Ruth, who in fact deeply loved her mother-in-law. So first, let's us, let us consider and acknowledge that Naomi was a loving mother-in-law. It's not the way it's supposed to be that parents have to bury children. And when faced with a tsunami of bad news, the death of a husband and the death of her two sons, Naomi scoops up the crumbled pieces of her heart and life and makes her way back. Her one daughter-in-law, Orpah, returns back to her Moabite roots. But Ruth clings to her. Have you ever asked yourself why? Why did Ruth cling to Naomi, her mother-in-law? Perhaps it was to fulfill the messianic promise that the Savior of the world would be born from the line of Ruth. Perhaps it was to remind us of the great mosaic of different people, races, cultures that make up the kingdom of God. Or perhaps it was to remind faithful Bible readers echoing down the canyons of time the true grit and grace of women in the Bible. But I might suggest a much more practical reason. Perhaps Ruth clung to her mother-in-law Naomi simply because Naomi was a loving mother-in-law. The Bible says to us that for 10 years it was Naomi, her daughters and sons, can you imagine in those 10 years all the meals shared, the bedtime stories, the birthdays, the anniversaries, all of the wonderful times of fellowship and hospitality that this family shared with one another? And I might go so far as to say that if Naomi was not a loving mother-in-law, then do not 
we think that at first crack, they would have bolted in the opposite direction of Naomi. But they don't. They cling close because she was a loving mother-in-law. So you're asking yourself, where am I going with this? And here's my point. Do you, do I, have a Naomi in our life? Do we have someone who might be a chapter ahead of us in life that is pouring love and wisdom into our life? Do we have someone that holds us accountable, a prayer partner, an encourager of the faith? Do we have someone in our life that we could honestly point to and say, that's what faithfully following Jesus looks like at that step in life? And not only do you have a Naomi, but are you a Naomi? Are you pouring out your wisdom and love and hospitality to someone in need? Because, dear friends, I don't know if you know this or not, but life is hard. It's hard. It's hard to be a parent of little kids who keep you up in the middle of the night and keep you on your patient's edge during the day. It's hard to be a parent of teenagers who think they're geniuses and you are completely out of touch with reality. It's hard to juggle 80-hour work weeks and make sense of normalcy. It's hard to care for an aging parent. It's hard to be a primary caregiver for a spouse or loved one. It's hard to deal with grace and kindness with coworkers and bosses who are unruly at best. Life is hard. Which is why, my friends, we cannot do this alone. We need one another. That's why things like Bible studies, fellowship groups are so important. That's why things like confirmation and confirmation mentors are so important. That's why what happens in the Edwards room after worship is so important around crafts of co coffee and bananas. Because we can't do this alone. We need one another. All of the encouragements, the texts, the emails, the calls, the meals, these are not just frivolous things, my friends. No, they help spur us on and keep us going in this arduous journey of faith. We need Naomi's in our life. And we need to be a Naomi to someone else. That's the first thing to consider about loving mother-in-laws. But let's look at this story from the perspective of Ruth, who without a doubt clearly loved her mother-in-law. Naomi. The cultural nuances are lost in our modern day interpretation. Ruth was a Moabite. Her husband was from Judah. This is a different religion, a different culture, a different customs, different background. And Ruth leaves it all behind her. Everything that was normal, everything that was comfortable, and she clung with fervor and passion to Naomi, her mother-in-law. Which reminds us of a very important characteristic when following Jesus. And that is this, my friends. Sometimes, we got to go all in. Sometimes, we have to put and push life's chips to the center of the table and go all in. To let it go, to leave it behind, to go all in for Jesus. The disciples 
went all in when they left those fish wriggling on the beach shore and followed. Saul pushed all of his chips in when he came through the waters of baptism and left his persecuting life behind and became Paul, the extraordinary church planter. Zacchaeus went all in for Jesus and left behind his scamming ways to faithfully follow. These and so many others like Ruth, they go all in. Perhaps it's just me. But when it comes to trying to make sense of this Christian faith, there are things that we are ready and willing to hand over to the Lord. But there are also things, if we were brutally honest, that we want to keep back for ourselves. There are portions and segments of our life, time, dollars, space, that we would best want to keep for ourselves. Ruth reminds us that sometimes Jesus calls us to go all in. I love these words from C.S. Lewis in his wonderful book, Mere Christianity. If you haven't read this book, I would highly recommend it. It's one of my favorites. He writes in a chapter called, Is Christianity Easy or Hard? This. The Christian way is different, harder and easier. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want to have the whole tree out. I don't want to drill the tooth or crown it or stop it, but to pull it out. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think innocent as well as the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own shall become yours. Don't you see, friends? Ruth teaches us that sometimes we got to go all in. And would you know it? And next week, we'll hear more about it. That eventually, Ruth marries a dashing and handsome man named Boaz. And together, they have a son named Obed. And Obed became the great-grandfather of King David, the direct line from Jesus. We know how the story ends. We know the genealogy. Ruth did not. She simply had to go all in and follow. Friends, more often than not, God does not give us a strategic plan from conception to execution when it comes to following. And more often than not, God does not give us navigational turn-by-turn -turn directions in a path of faithfulness. No, more often than not, God simply calls us to go all in and follow. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the word written the Bible, but above all, the word made flesh, Jesus, in whom we have life and life eternal. It's in his name we pray. Amen.